today uh, we'll be talking about mapping and mobilizing Canada's captive wildlife and a little bit about us. Uh, my name is Ryan Belarjan. I'm the founder uh, and CEO of Grass Riots. I'm Jeffrey Frey and I'm the Senior Manager of Digital Strategy and Engagement at World Animal Protection Canada. Uh, a little bit about Grass Riots. Uh, we're very proud to be celebrating our 10th year uh, supporting the nonprofit uh, sector. Um, uh, what we're known for is smart and effective fundraising, advocacy strategy, values led creative and storytelling, performance driven digital marketing, and a trusted technology and platform expertise. Um, we're a certified B Corporation, and we've just ha celebrated our renewal um, and uh, had incredible results in terms of improving our governance. Um, we are living wage certified in Canada, um, and in the last year, uh, we have ratified an agreement and have been organized with QP um, 1281. Um, a little bit about our work supporting Engaging Networks. I started as a client uh, customer of Engaging Networks back in 2005. Um, Graham Covington used to answer my support phone calls. Um, and since then, um, uh, we have become a uh, full service accredited partner uh, across uh, both technology, implementation, account services, and innovation. Um, and uh, we work with a lot of customers who are at various stages of their work on engaging networks, and it's one of our favorite platforms to support. Oh, yeah, switch. <laughs> All right, um, so I'm with World Animal Protection Canada. Um, World Animal Protection is a global nonprofit dedicated to improving the, uh, animal welfare. Um, I've been with World Animal Protection Canada for um, almost eight years now, and it was my first week that uh, I met Grass Riots and uh, had the chance to work with them, and uh, I've been, uh, had the pleasure of working with them and learning from them ever since. Um, We've partnered to uh, create lead generation and direct donation campaigns, as well as email templates and deliverability reports, which we still reference today. Um, beyond that, we've developed impactful behavior change campaigns, like the one on the screen, focused on dolphin entertainment. By presenting a compelling mix of data and real-world evidence, we are able to engage with major corporations and push them to take meaningful action, shifting their policies and practices to align with humane and sustainable and ethical standards. Um, example of some impact up on the screen, uh, we uh, were able to move uh, Air Canada and Transat to commit to phasing out dolphin uh, entertainment packages from their offerings and to work with their tourism partners to do the same. Another impactful campaign I want to share, uh, one of my favorite projects with Grass Riots was our social listening report on wildlife selfies. Um, so this initiative used image recognition software to identify and analyze the scale of wildlife selfies shared on social media platforms. Um, and these insights revealed the scale of the issue, showing how widespread selfies were across social media. We leveraged this data to raise awareness and apply public pressure, which ultimately led to Instagram putting up a warning when people were using these harmful wildlife hashtags um, and to um, start to raise awareness themselves. So I'm thrilled to share a new tool that Grass Riots developed for us as part of our efforts to tackle the wildlife trade. Before diving into this tool, I wanted to give a quick overview of why this issue is so critical. The global wildlife trade is responsible for the exploitation of millions of wild animals every year, and the impacts are on animal welfare and on public health uh, are far-reaching. In Canada, we have our own challenges with the trade. Uh, world Animal Protection Canada has conducted leading research uh, that has brought much needed attention to the scale of this issue and this research has helped us to um, work with closely with government agencies to address key issues and risks associated with the trade. Despite our efforts there are um, some drivers that are still not being addressed and uh, we continue to see the consequences in the headlines. Employees in shock after Lion Mall's worker at Granby Zoo Python on lawn shocks Halifax woman. Emu found wandering on northern BC logging road. Um, these are all real headlines. We saw these in the newspaper. Other people see them in the newspaper. These incidents illustrate the gaps in regulations and enforcement and uh, really do illustrate the need for urgent action. 
Um, this is a map that Grass Riots actually developed for us in 2019. Uh, we wanted to highlight the patchwork of ineffective policies at the federal level um, and also at the provincial and territorial level. You can click into any of these regions and look at the um, strengths and weaknesses of regulations. It also allows you to use uh, Engaging Network's email to target uh, capabilities to send a, an email directly to the minister responsible so that you can take action. Actually, so um, this is, we're actually honed in on Ontario here and uh, the quote kind of perfectly sums up uh, some of the key challenges in Ontario that you can build. You can't build a patio with getting, without getting a license, but you can open up a zoo. Um, so this led to the next map that I'm excited to share with you today. Um, it's an interactive map of captive wildlife incidents across Canada. Um, there are over 285 incidents currently on the map uh, showing wild animal escapes and attacks, diseases, outbreaks, and seizures. Um, so we wanted to bring those headlines back into the conversation. We wanted to engage people on them, and this map was a way to do that, to show people what might be happening in their backyard. Um, or what might be happening in the community over. We approached grass riots with our objectives. Uh, we wanted to shift perception to demonstrate that these are not isolated incidents. We wanted to expose regulatory gaps, highlighting the inconsistencies and failures in current laws. And we wanted to drive action and mobilize the public. Each of those map markers or pins uh, represents, one, represents one of those headlines. You can click into each of them and you can see more information about the incident, um, and you can engage with the content, you can visit other sources of, of uh, information, um, or take action. Uh, we launched the map in May 2024, so or in May this year. Uh, we did it to coincide with the start of roadside zoo season in Ontario. Uh, I'm happy to share that we were featured in over 146 media outlets, including Canadian Free Press, CTV, and CBC Radio Canada. And we received really positive feedback from supporters in the general public. I've got a quote here from uh, somebody sent us an email after uh, seeing our, uh, one of our media uh, articles and uh, was just a, uh, shared their positive feedback that we were addressing this issue. And uh, we're also happy to share some other incidents that we had not on the map yet, but they're up there now. What's next? Um, so unfortunately, these incidents are constantly happening. And with this tool, we're able to really quickly get a new map marker on the map with all of the content around the incident. And uh, that allows us to capture those moments and get people to engage with those headlines while also engaging with the larger issue uh, in a very visual and interactive way. Um, our campaign is, is national across the country, but we're really focused on Ontario, that province that uh, showed uh, had, you didn't need a regulation to open up a zoo. Um, so we're focused on engaging municipalities there. The province is not taking responsibility and the burden is, is being passed down to municipalities who are not equipped to handle it. Uh, so we're working with municipalities to adopt a resolution to encourage the province to take action. And uh, the tool, this tool is just another powerful way to engage those stakeholders and for them to engage their stakeholders on that as well. Thank you. Great. So um, it's uh, my... Uh, 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 pleasure to actually talk about how this map came together and how it works. Um, so when we first engaged with uh, Jeffrey and World Animal Protection on this project, um, you know, we had a lot of questions. And in our experience in working specifically on mapping projects, there's a lot of really uh, great upfront conversations that can have to uh, really hone in on what we're trying to build together. And so um, I've added these questions here because these are questions that you can ask yourselves or your team about um, the type of mapping experience that maybe you're interested in developing. First, what kind of map are we developing? Uh, it's a broad question but it's something that we really wanted to hone in on because maps can be academic, they can be research oriented, they can be editorial, um, and uh, they can be served to specific audiences in specific contexts. We wanted to really understand how World Animal Protection sought to use this map in terms of its campaigning um, and the various audiences that would be engaging with it. Um, the second is, is what is the quality and quantity of data that we're working with? Um, and uh, that can be very broad depending on the issue that you're um, trying to visualize um, and the objectives that you're trying to achieve in presenting that to uh, an audience. Um, and um, it can be very surprising. You can really uncover some insights in terms of like what is the actual utility of the data that you have in presenting this challenge. 
Um, how often does the data change? Some maps are static. Sometimes you build a map, present it, and it's really just a snapshot in time. And sometimes, like in the case with the captive wildlife map, we're trying to tell an ongoing story. Um, and it's really good to also understand that who is maintaining this map? Where is that data coming from? What are the responsibilities on your team to upkeep this map? And how will they be published on an ongoing basis? The other is what kind of experience are we trying to deliver? You know, um, what is our objective in terms of how people will use and navigate the data in the map? Um, what is the journey that we want them to take? What is the education component of the map? What is the um, aha moment that we're trying to deliver? And how are we driving people to action? Um, finally, we really want to take into account the user. What, what is the audience for this map? How, what are their expectations in engaging with the map in terms of what they're seeking and the information that they're trying to um, envelop? And, um, and to really start to build out those different journeys and the features of the map that support those audiences. Finally, where do I want users to focus? Uh, in presenting a map with a lot of data points, um, sometimes it can be crowding in terms of like getting people's attention to where you need it. Can you hone in on areas that are specific to them? Can you find data that's near to a user that's more contextual? Can we tell a story that is both broad but specific in terms of their context? Um, and, and how do we drive them through that engagement to take action? Um, so in, in really exploring um, these, uh, these conversations, we, we had to com come up with a strategy in terms of what technology would support each of these outcomes. Um, and what we knew going into this, um, very specifically as a request from World Animal Protection, is that they wanted this to be an easy experience to maintain, right? They were dealing with a lot of data. And they wanted to be able to ensure that over time they could edit and change that data, they could increase the amount of data, they could edit it, they could feature specific information, they could have flexibility in terms of the actions that they were presenting. Um, and they wanted it to be maintainable. Um, and that's what's landed us on using engaging networks as the core place to visualize this data and to present that. We had some experience before with World Animal Protection in building maps on engaging networks. But we knew the level of interacti interactivity would have to change. Um, and that's what uh, led us to introduce Mapbox. Um, and so in this workflow, Engaging Networks is responsible for loading and hosting the experience, as well as processing the actions themselves. Um, Mapbox is responsible for loading and populating a map, styling the layers, adding the marker data, and really providing that experience of how to navigate and engage with a map or an interactive map. And, uh, and then the final solution and one of the biggest achievements we think is using and integrating Google Sheets as the place to manage the data. So that all, all marker data, everything that you see on the map is easily maintained uh, collaboratively through Google Sheets so we can edit, manage markers and markers data. Um, so um, that technology choice really led us to some advantages, which is, is we could really have complex markers. And markers are the core of the map. They represent the headlines that Jeffrey stated about. Um, and um, they can be really quite complex in terms of the information that we're trying to deliver. Um, not just the headline, but, uh, but detail about the impact of that incident. Um, and so we were able to build out uh, a database um, using a lot of different data points. So a description of, uh, of the incident, the title, media URLs, so photos and photo captions, um, setting a map marker as featured, even having custom map markers to highlight them on the map, uh, reference links to the originating articles, using categories and tags. Categories were, were a big part of the discussion that we had in terms of um, how to really uh, organize uh, these incidents. And we talked about attacks and escapes. We talked about disease outbreaks and um, um, other, uh, um, other, what was the other category? Wildlife trade. Wildlife trade, thank you. Um, but that's where we spent a lot of time. We wanted to build categories that weren't just meaningful to world animal protection, but really spoke to the audience so that they understood the impacts that were, they were having on this issue in their community. Um, and then tags. Tags was another feature that allows us to curate a number of different incidents together to tell a more narrative story. And we can actually use tags in order to drive specific experiences to audiences. So if journalists, if we're talking about specifically disease outbreaks or um, a specific species, we can merge a number of markers together, send a specific link to that journalist, and they can see all of those incidents within that category or tag. 
Um, and then location data. Obviously locations, that's the purpose of a map. We want to be able to map things, but we wanted to make that easy. Um, and then providing the context and analysis for each marker that World Animal Protection may want to provide. So some of the more uh, prominent stories or relevant stories, they can add detail and context to both the action that's associated with it and the incident itself. Um, and finally, action. So how are we moving this marker, this information, this specific uh, uh, piece of data to a user taking action and having some flexibility there in terms of what we present and how we present it. And, uh, and Google Sheets was a solution for that. So this was a really great solution in terms of being able to catalog all of this information. And we really used Google Sheets as a simple database, a way for us to easily enter and edit data in Google Sheets directly, to be able to provide rich content and support markdowns so that we could actually present um, formatted HTML on marker data, um, to provide processing rules so that we could use functions and validations to allow us to ensure very strict data types within those columns, um, and to do automatic geolocation. So starting with, you know, some of these uh, incidents, you don't get a specific address, you get a city or a town. And we wanted to be able to make sure that the maps on the markers were meaningful and um, specific, and so we could geolocate them and also process them through Mapbox. Um, and also that the updates would be reflected immediately through the API. So as you edit the Google Sheet, if when you hit publish on a marker, it immediately appears on the map after uh, just a minute. Um, and, uh, and then as well as the flexibility for us to access the data in a way that was useful for our developers so that we could um, use the Google Sheets API to retrieve all the data in a JSON format and use that format to publish directly to Mapbox and, and edit and manipulate it as we needed to. Now, there were some, um, some caveats to using this implementation. Uh, the most important for us was that uh, requests are limited to only 300 a minute. So the Google API does have some restrictions there. Um, but uh, for us, we were able to cache those responses so that for individual user sessions, they really only had to hit the API once to get all of that data and then populate the map one time. So we haven't really seen us even reaching that limit very closely. Um, and then also, the sheet is technically public. So in order for the API to work, the, uh, the sheet has to be publicly accessible. Now it's only in view mode when, when users access it at that, at that, in, in that way. Uh, we don't publish the URL, but also for us um, in working with uh, World Animal Protection, the solution was, was useful because uh, really they want to see this as a public resource so, um, so that people can both contribute to it um, and report their own incidents, but also use this data um, for various journalistic pr purposes. Um, and um, one of the ways in which we uh, uh, were able to merge like, the power of engaging networks with Google Sheets was redirecting actions dynamically. So each marker in the database has an associated action from a list of available actions. And these actions can be uh, a variety of different engaging networks, but also redirected actions. Um, so just by using campaign IDs or specific calls to action with links, um, we can associate each marker with something that's relevant to maybe the province or community that's, that's, that's within, or that these actions can change over time. So very easy for uh, World Animal Protection to say, we're going to direct all map activity to this specific action because this is the thing that we want people to be doing right now. Um, and using engaging networks redirect and filter in order to process that kind of first page data on the landing page, but then redirect to any secondary location and process um, uh, maybe it's an email to target or maybe it's a, a petition. Um, so it was a really great way to link those things together. Uh, in choosing the, the right mapping platform, uh, Mapbox provided an easy way for us to edit map layers, provided a robust API to populate and manipulate markers. It reduced our development time while offering very enterprise features. And with nonprofit pricing and usage-based billing, we actually come in under the free account tier. So we're not paying anything to use this. We, the maximum views per month were well within our range in terms of our traffic. And uh, if we needed to pay for an account, it would actually be very affordable. Um, so what makes a map a good map? Uh, first of all, when we're building a map, we want to offer multiple ways to navigate. And I think this is a challenge for some maps. But, you know, being able to access data, not just through engaging in the map, but through submenus, filters, and categories, really helps users find the information that they're looking for. Uh, we want to maintain norms. Um, you know, I'd say 10 years ago, we were still trying to figure out how maps work on mobile. Now all of that has been figured out for us. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. 
try to use uh, or build maps that users understand pinch and zoom um, uh, and, and the various tools that we expect to see on things like Google Maps. Also help and guide users to what's important. You have a map with 283 points. If a user is having trouble finding information that's exciting, engaging, try to point them to it. Try to tell a story along with the information that's on a map so that you're guiding users to what's important and you can guide them to, uh, to continued action. Um, and uh, not all maps are good maps, and uh, I think we've all probably had some frustrating experiences in the past, and these are some of the pitfalls that we try to avoid when we're building map experiences. Um, so your map doesn't have enough data. Um, you know, sometimes it, it, the data quality or quantity is just not sufficient in order to use a map or have a map that actually tells a, a story. Uh, your data isn't visually interesting. You put your data on a map, but it really doesn't tell anything, or you have to adjust the expectation of the user, and um, uh, it's just not the right way to visually tell the story of, of what your data is. Um, or your map is hard to navigate. This is a common pitfall in Canada, but some of our provinces are really tiny compared to the rest of our provinces. And if you have to drag your mouse over to Prince Edward Island and try to click on that, you're not going to be able to find it. It's maybe only going to be a couple pixels in size on a phone. Um, and, uh, and, and then what's, what's the point? Your map is incomplete. And this is a problem down, <laughs> down here in the US. You see a lot of maps of... Uh, of, of the states, but they're missing Alaska and Hawaii. And uh, that can be really frustrating. And, and, and actually, in, in a lot of global or international contexts, um, uh, lines of demarcation can be very controversial. So depending on what you're presenting and how you're presenting it, this is something you really have to consider. Or your map is unusable on mobile. And I think this is one of the modalities that you really have to consider is if somebody is navigating your map on a mobile device, um, how easy is it to use? How hard is it to access the data that you have? Here we have a crowded display of a number of different markers. If my objective is to click on those, it's going to be very hard to isolate um, just even from a touch perspective where, where to click. That comes down to something that we tell clients all the time, and Morgan will know this. Uh, you don't need a map. Maybe you don't need a map. You have a very interesting uh, amount of data. You have some great objectives, but a map may not be the right interface in order to do that. Something I like to say is that like maps are really bad at navigating. For some reason, it's, it's funny to say, but like it's not a great way to use as a navigation tool on your site. You know, If you need somebody to access information or go deeper into your website, a map is very hard to use. It's very hard to find the right places to click, and they can be very overwhelming for users. But if you like maps, here are some more, and I'll just skip to one of our um, favorite, more recent projects. This is a project we've been working with, Tobacco Free Kids, for the last seven years. Um, this map catalogs um, points of sale for tobacco products near schools within 150 meters in violation of the World Health Organization's policy on tobacco control. This is over 21 countries and uh, uh, over 100 cities and about tw um, close to 20,000 markers. Um, and this is used for um, uh, tobacco control organizations that are working to change policies and legislations in their country. Um, this is a map that we are open sourcing to the tobacco, tobacco control community through um, training and education in order to build um, people to uh, find these incidents and advocate for legislative changes. It's been very successful in moving the needle uh, both at the global health um, level and also on the front lines. Um, and if you would like to access uh, the captive wildlife map, um, there's three ways you can do that. By visiting worldanimalprotection.ca forward slash map, by searching for a map in Canada's wildlife problem on Google, or by using the QR code available here. Um, finally, I'd just like to thank some of the team that was responsible for building this, specifically Michelle uh, Hammers, who is not here um, with us today. Um, she was a pivotal part of the team in building and constructing this map. Um, our development team at Grass Riots, World Animal Protection, Jeffrey, um, Grass Riots, and uh, Engaging Networks. So um, thank you to them. Um, and uh, we're happy to take some questions. So we have nine regions that we work with that are all zip code based. So we have a giant table of every zip code in the country and its associated region. We've never found a good solution to be able to work with that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so s there are 
in, in these mapping app applications, these platforms, the ability to use your own shape files, and that may be what you're trying to do here. So we have the same problem in Canada, it's just like not all um, uh, voting regions, electoral uh, districts are uh, postal code based, like easily, you know, merged together with the postal code database. And so we have to build custom shape files in order to cut, you know, canvassing uh, maps and things like that. Um, it does take a, a little bit of work, but there are actually applications that help you build shape files just by drawing them around regions, so streets and area codes and things like that. Um, but that's generally been the approach that we've seen taken to to solve those problems. Yeah, yeah. So, um, what level of effort is it to maintain the map? Um, so, with the uh, Google Sheet, uh, first of all, we'll also say like everything you see in a map marker, you'll see on the Google Sheet. So, it is very um, there's no sensitive information that's not public. Um, we do have a backup sheet that our non-technical people, our program team, can enter data into, um, and that makes it really easy for any of the technical people that work in engaging networks to just copy that over into the Google Sheet, making sure that it just fits all the right requirements, um, and then it's live. Another. And there is a, there is a public unpublished button, um, and that makes it easy to just add a number of markers without showing them on the map before they're ready. Okay, and we've just got one more question here before we break um, for the next Academy session, but is the map accessible? Um, so that was definitely an objective um, uh, with us, and uh, we do run, we uh, we do run accessibility um, tests on our map um, uh, while we're developing and, and as a part of our QA process. Um, and yeah, that's generally our objective. So both in terms of its uh, uh, mobile display and, and desktop, is to uh, ensure that that's accessible. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. I think that's all we have time for today. Thank you so much. Both that was that was an incredible presentation. Really appreciate it.